we have a number of exercises you can can do. Uh, they shouldn't be too hard. Um, and I hope for um, for a bit of discussion also. Um, as Tiziano said, uh, we'll have a break in um, in two hours' time. That should be uh, quite enough um, to cover uh, the material we have prepared. And after that, we have a second uh, uh, session with some more advanced stuff. Uh, also, some other um, exercises you can do. So let's make uh, make this an interesting uh, workshop. Um, okay. Well. Um, if you talk about object-oriented programming in Fortran, uh, you have to realize that we are using mostly the C++ model or Java. Um, so um, objects are defined via classes and um, they um, have uh, methods to them. They have very um, values. Um, and that's done um, in the Fortran language using modules and derived types. So the module is in fact um, the, the, uh, the scope where you define uh, your derived type with methods. Um, officially they're called um, type bound procedures and we'll see how it works. Um, and there is not such a thing as a, as a class you define uh, like you would in C++, but um, uh, the type definition, along with the, uh, the definitions of the, of the various methods, that's how you define uh, the class. Um, besides these syntactical uh, differences, there are also a number of um, perhaps more, uh, more important differences. And we'll go into that uh, later. Uh, but let's first start with uh, the, the simple things. Um, so we have um, derived types and these types are in fact extensible nowadays. So here we have um, our first type um, called simply my type. It has a value, um, an integer value, and we have <coughs> one procedure uh, called write and that um, links to a, um, a subroutine called write my type. So write is in fact an alias for this particular subroutine. Um, that appears here, here below. And what you can see is that we have a, um, an argument V, which is of the class my type. And we have um, an integer uh, argument LUN, uh, so the logical unit number. Um, note that we use here class rather than type. Um, this means that this a uh, particular subroutine could be overwritten by um, uh, a derived, by an extended type. We'll show that later. Um, but also um, that this could be used, used by um, types derived from my type. So that's a bit of uh, sometimes confusing uh, syntax. Uh, the compiler is very, very keen on warning you about it, so don't worry too much. But this is basically what, what we do. And the way we used it is this. Um, so we have the, uh, the module. We have a variable of this type. <coughs> and we can call the method write uh, like this. So the name of the variable uh, percent and then the name of the, um, of the method we want to use and the arguments. And you will note that it doesn't have the argument v. That first argument we have here, that's, uh, that's implicit. So um, actually, uh, this would could al also be uh, called as call write my type um, v comma 10. Well, this is the um, object oriented way and the alternative uh, you can also use if you want. So basically, we have um, uh, a variable of a type that contains a method right, and we can call that method uh, in this way. It takes a bit of getting used to, um, but that's the way uh, things work in, in Fortran, and you'll see very similar things in, in C++ and Java, and you name it, Python. 
Um, these derived types can be extended. And so um, what you do is you have the basic type, uh, in this case, my type with a value um, of type integer, and you can extend it, giving it a new name, and it inherits, in fact, all the properties that this one has, and you can add new ones. What you can't do is um, redefine value to be a, a real, for instance. So we have to use a different name, but you can override uh, the methods we have. Um, so to summarize this, um, this new type inherits everything you um, you have in the in the uh, in the base type, and you can define new components, and some can be overwritten. So let's continue this. Um, <coughs> so we have um, this this variable of new type. We can have um, we can print it the, the the value, and we have also access to um, to the value of the parent. Uh, and this is the um, way we do that in, in Fortran. <coughs> so this is the name of the basic type. Uh, you insert it here, and then you get the access to uh, the other, um, other values and other methods. OK, well, this is a bit, bit of uh, syntax. Um, you can't override the, the values, the, the, the variables, um, components in uh, a type, but you can change uh, the procedures. So in this case, I want uh, the method write to use write my new type instead of just uh, write my type. And this type, this routine now, looks quite similar. Here we have uh, as class my type, my new type. Um, I get again the logical unit number, and now what I do is I invoke uh, the original routine and I put in something extra. That's one way to use these sort of things. It could also be something completely different, as long as the uh, the argument list um, corresponds to the original. So here's a small. Um, more or less practical example. Um, quasi random numbers, I wanted to do that because it's actual code I have um, written and use. Um, so not just a, a, um, a, uh, a course example. Uh, so the type is uh, a quasi random generator. Uh, it produces quasi random numbers. That's a bit different than pseudo random numbers. Um, this contains a few. Um, few properties, and here we have a number of methods. Uh, so the procedure in it makes sure that um, variables of this type are, um, um, are initialized. I can restart it because it keeps track of um, this step size, this step. Um, I can have um, coordinates for these quadrant numbers in single precision and in double precision. And um, to make sure that I can um, ignore the difference between the two, two um, methods, I have this generic one next, which simply uh, looks at the, um, at the argument I give with it, and it selects either the single version or the double version. So this way you can make, uh, you can overload the, the methods um, in the same way you can use uh, do with a with an interface um, outside the object-oriented programming. Um, and here's uh, a small example of how to use that. Quasi-random numbers select points in, a, in an n-dimensional space. Um, what I do here is I want um, to be in a three-dimensional space because my array coordinates is three-dimensional, uh, has three elements. So this um, takes care that uh, we get points in a three-dimensional space. Um, and I sum the value of this particular sum, this particular um, function over a number of points, and I get the approximate integral. And as you can see, I used a, a percent notation to, um, 
to invoke the various methods. That's a very simple example of how you can use um, um, these, these uh, <coughs> object-oriented techniques. And the first exercise does something very similar. Um, let's uh, look at that uh, exercise uh, in a few moments. Here I want to, um, to uh, stress a bit that in stretch of time definition, you can also use default values just as you're used to. Um, and you can use that to check, for instance, that the implementation, um, uh, that the object has been properly initialized um, by checking whether the default values are still around or whether something more sensible is, uh, is set. Um, these derived types with methods, with um, type bound procedures, uh, work in, in very much the same way as, uh, as the ordinary derived types you're used to. Um, so let's, um, let's have a look at the first uh, exercise. So you can do something more than, oh, where am I? Here you go. Um, in the document exercise.pdf, you'll find a number of uh, exercises. And this one is the first. Um, it is a, uh, a small exercise to, to make um, an, an object or a class that uh, keeps track of, of data you put in and uh, reports uh, the moving average. You have a number of uh, small um, a small number of, of, of uh, parameters that you can set. For instance, how many values to use for the moving, moving average. Um, you can um, put in values, you can get an average out. Uh, so it's very basic. Uh, it shouldn't take you too long to, uh, to do something like this. And you get, get, a, you get a bit acquainted with the, uh, with the uh, syntax. So I suggest we spend some 10 minutes or so on um, looking at this, uh, this uh, exercise. Um, I'll bring in the other document again with the, uh, with the basic, uh, basic syntax. So you can um, see how things work. And if you have any questions, then please uh, tell me.
Right. Um, let's uh, let's continue. Uh, Bill uh, uh, found a few uh, glitches in my uh, in my stuff. Um, of course, this should be something else than than some. Uh, so I'm correcting that. But um, the principle is is there. Um, this is the way to invoke these methods, um, and um, the the methods use this one, this uh, object implicitly as the first argument. We'll come back to that uh, uh, later on. All right, okay. Um, well, if you, as you've seen, dummy arguments, um, if you use these methods, these type-bound procedures, you s you'll see a class rather than a type as the keyword. Um, this class means that um, the variable or the argument here is a so-called polymorphic argument. Um, it can be um, of this particular type, but it can also be of a type which is derived from this, an extended type. Um, and that makes a difference from, from what we have here. Here you, you are forced to always pass um, um, a variable of, of this particular type, and here we have a whole cascade of types, if you want. Um, and the term polymorphic is, is used for this sort, of, uh, uh, this sort of types, this sort of uh, variables. Um, and we encounter um, also what is called an unlimited polymorphic type. Uh, that's basically something which can hold any kind of data. Um, and that comes later. <coughs> So um, something which has been introduced um, via the uh, object-oriented programming paradigm we have now is um, a difference between the declared type and the dynamic type. These polymorphic types um, have both. Uh, so you declare them uh, to be uh, of the type my type, my data. Um, but um, they can also be something uh, derived from that, uh, extended from that. And to make um, sure that we are using the, set, the, right, um, the right form, so the right dynamic type, you can use the uh, select type uh, construct. Um, here we have type, uh, another type, and class. Um, type is means that um, the, the variable has to be exactly of this particular type. So not um, an extended one, but actually uh, my data. Um, and that's the declare type. Um, the same for, um, for this one. It's extended from my data in the previous, um, in the previous slides, but it's different from this one. Um, and then you have class is my data, and that could fit both uh, variables of this, uh, this type and this type and anything uh, beyond that. <coughs> the way this works is that the more specific something is, is um, 
that will be chosen. So if we pass in um, a variable um, that is declared as type my data, then this one will hold and not this one. Um, so we can, can use this uh, select type structure to, um, to more or less um, cast uh, our variables into a particular type and do something with that which is useful for that particular type. There are also a few um, intrinsic functions for this, um, extends type of and same type as. So these two can help also uh, deciding what to do with uh, the, the particular, um, particular data. I mentioned already unlimited polymorphic uh, types. Well, it can be very useful if you want to store information um, of very different uh, uh, different origins. Um, there are two, basically two two declarations possible. Uh, here, class uh, the star the asterisk means that it is unlimited, and it's a pointer or it's an allocable, and you can um, actually uh, store. Uh, the basic types, so, so integers, reals, and um, dull precision reals, etc. You can all store them in such a uh, polymorphic type. And um, this way you can identify what the dynamic type is. It works in uh, quite the same way as we, we saw before you know, on this slide. But um, you can use this, this kind of um, variables to, uh, to store data um, of any kind you want. There are a few drawbacks and that is that an unlimited polymorphic type is not used, cannot be used uh, uh, directly. They can be used as, um, as arguments um, and then in the routine you, you can decide what they should be by uh, declaration or by these uh, uh, select type um, constructs. Um, if you do that you more or less transform them into a specific type because the compiler knows um, at this moment this particular um, variable is of that um, that type, so it can identify the components and the methods, etc. Um, and like I said, they are either pointers or allocatables, and it also holds for uh, scalar variables. I think that was the last slide here. Yes. Um, so this is a bit the basic um, things about um, object-oriented programming in, in Fortran. That's the syntax part. Um, Tiziano will, um, will present something about patterns. That's also a very, um, very common subject if you look at um, descriptions of how to use uh, object-oriented programming. For now, any questions? Um, I think there have been oh, a couple okay. of questions. Um, yes. One is, could you possibly elaborate on what unlimited uh, means here? Uh, sure. Um, and I saw also see a question by Bill. Um, so please ignore my uh, uh, my uh, my syntax uh, uh, mistakes. Uh, that's what you get when you uh, try to do it without uh, actually compiling the, the stuff. Um, an unlimited polymorphic type means that it's a, it's a sort of placeholder uh, for any variable you uh, want to uh, uh, to use there. Um, you could compare it to what you have in C and C++ as a void star. Um, so it doesn't have any, um, any particular um, type. So it could, uh, could function as, a, as an integer, as you see here. It could function as a, uh, as a derived type. It could be a class. Um, so anything in fact, and you have to um, help the compiler 
to identify what, um, what you want to do with it. Um, is that clear enough? We were using them in one of the exercises uh, to, store, um, to store all kinds of data in, in one long array. Um, there isn't really much more you can say about them. Um, they, they, they can be any, any uh, collection of data in disguise. Um, I think, well, for me, that, that's okay. Um, so there was another question about type is integer. Do you know whether one could also specify what kind of integer? Um, yeah, it should be possible. Um, I'm thinking about the, uh, about the syntax for that. Um, gosh, let me, let me check. Um, I've got my book. It, it should indeed be possible. Well, can't find it right now, but uh, let me uh, let me just try it. Um. Maybe in the meantime, um, someone posted a link where to compile Fortran on the fly, uh, on the web. Uh, I guess uh, Audrey will also be pleased if you, of course, start using his uh, L Fortran online uh, compiler. So that would be another option. a very useful program, but uh, let's see what uh, the compiler makes of this. That seems to be the, the way to do it. Sorry, just specify the kind. Are you, are you sure you now don't specify a dimension? Dimension would be um, no, you can't specify a dimension like that. If you want to spit dimension, you would get something like uh, so. Then, how uh, do you want to know if it is of a type array, uh, of, of, if it is an array uh, of, of that type? P, P is declared as a scalar, so it's not a, not an array. <clears throat> if you want to make it an array, you'd have to put uh, parentheses after P in the declaration of class. Yeah, yeah like this, correct, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. The variable has to be an array or a scalar. It can't, it can't be either. So you have to specify somewhere in the declaration it has to be an array. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yes. And of course, P is not associated with anything, so this no could have caught that and given you an error. <clears throat> no, we can try that.
<clears throat> you you haven't uh, you haven't assigned anything to P, so it doesn't have a type yet. So your your select type. No, we'll be talking. To you. Yeah, that'll work. Yep. <clears throat> Almost. It's class default. Class default, yes. Is this sort of things which makes it uh, uh, hard sometimes? Yeah, you're right. So that means that um, such a, a variable has um, a, a default dynamic type then. Or is that too much, asking too much? Because a pointer which is not um, initialized um, is, is actually undefined, of course. Mm -hmm. The, the class default matches no matter what. Oh, right. Okay. So it doesn't... Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes sense in, in, a, in a way. So just to show the code again. Um, so if you initialize the pointer P to point to Y, and, the, and you make P an array, yeah. uh, then, then you might be able to get the first one. I can also make it pass. Um, come on. Yep. And make this uh, uh, kind two, because otherwise it won't work. Right. I, I believe you'll also have to make it a target. Yep. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Live programming, right? <laughs> Function one. And I think it's still a rank mismatch. No, it's, you're missing an A yeah. in target. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, should, I shouldn't uh, use the wrong uh, keyword, of course. But now I um, I yeah. point to only one uh, uh, element of the uh, of the array, so this should work. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Um, well, since we're talking about pointers, maybe this is a good idea, good moment to uh, to look at the, uh, the one of the other presentations I have. Um, uh, just not a short question from my side about um, type bound procedures. Yeah. There you define the self as a class. Inside the, the procedure body. Uh, let me check. There was somewhere here. Yeah, here you have class my new type. So is it is it mandatory that you use class, or would it be possible to use also use type as a kind of like trying to um, prevent that the, the function yes is overridden by an extended type of it yes anyway, yeah um i'm always a cl uh, slightly confused about this but you can indeed um say that um this is a type rather than class but that means that you can't um use that type to um to extend this i think this is a, this is a bit a part a part of the, the, the of the uh, of this paradigm which I'm not too familiar with. Um, I think you can do that, and um, the effect is probably that you can't um, override the type. I don't. Um, I don't. 
I don't think this is possible actually, uh, because it's flagged. You, it's a uh, well, you can try. Let's see if I have uh, something usable. Right, let me take this one. Um, I'll make user type, yeah, type. This will either compile or it won't compile. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, by default, what happens here? Um, by default, such a procedure uh, gets um, as the first argument uh, the class. And here I, f I, I say it's a, it's a type rather than a class. So if I want to do that, then I should actually use no pass. No pass. No pass should be uh, before the yeah. that. I'm too hasty. <laughs> so that works. And now can we... So now you have to manually pass a... Yes, uh, then you yeah. pass manually, yes. Um, and that's part of uh, uh, another, um, the advanced um lecture let's see we, whether we can extend this one yeah it's still possible but of course, um, this um, um, this procedure will take only um, an argument of this type and not of this type. So um, it is um, still consistent. The, yeah, the procedure is, is still usable, but um, you have to do um, you have to pass exactly that particular uh, type rather than uh, a class, uh, either the, the base class or something derived from that. And I guess you have to pass it now then um, explicitly. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, well, we'll see that later. Yes. Cool, thanks. Yeah, this sort of thing makes it uh, um, a, bit, uh, a bit awkward sometimes. Um, I have uh, struggled with that myself, um, so I'm a bit faster in recognizing than what, what's wrong than um, if you really start uh, with these sort of things. And it can be confusing, I, I must uh, really admit. Um, okay, well, um, any more questions I saw? One thing? Um, a question from Patrick Silvat um, about select type.
um, that concerns the um, the fact that you still have to um, to use um, a select type if you have a polymorph variable that is set to a certain dynamic type, but the dynamic type is not automatically known. Um, would be nice if we have a concrete example of that. Then we can see the code and see um, whether there's some sort of solution for that. I'm not quite sure that uh, you can do that. Uh, Patrick, uh, can you? Yeah, um, so I don't have an example right now, but I just right. had uh, this situation uh, a couple of times that I allocated something to be a very specific dynamic type and then still had to use the select type if I had to access the member of, of this uh, dynamic type. So, but I can give a code example later on. Right, okay. But, okay. Yeah, it's, it's this sort of thing which makes it uh, um, a bit awkward sometimes. Um, also, so, so what, what I wanted to know if, if you, so you, had, you have just one case, then the select case is kind of the wrong construct. So what I would like to have is to say, if, um, instead of select type, something like if type is, this would be much shorter if you actually have one, just one case. Yeah. Um, so that this kind of, you have several constructs or that you can can say to the compiler, now I want to treat this um, polymorphic um, allocatable to be just one dynamic type and then the compiler knows and you don't have to go through the select type uh, with, with I know what you mean. specific. Uh, you run into that if you if you do um, um, arithmetic operations on this uh, this sort of things, then the first argument um, is or to automatically taken care of, but the second argument, so uh, addition for instance, um, let me just try that. So uh, addition. You would of course have a plus b, and then um, this one gets class my type automatically. But um, you have to do a select type on b to get it right. Okay. Yeah. That's the sort of things that that is. Yeah, it's it's awkward. Okay. Um, but let's see whether we can can do something with your uh, your example. Would be nice to to uh, to know that. Okay, so I can type a link to the example later. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay. Um, unlimited automatic, unlimited polymorphic variables is duct taping. Yeah. Yes, as, uh, as Brad already said, um, it's indeed uh, the select type uh, uh, construct that you use that you need to use. Okay. Um, well, we have had some discussion about this uh, in the weeks before this uh, this meeting. Um, pointers and allocatables. I would like to uh, uh, to talk about that for a bit. Oops. Yeah. <coughs> um, something which is quite different in Fortran than it is in, in C and C++ is that uh, pointers um, mean more than just uh, an address. Um, and we also have allocatables, which is something which um, doesn't appear in C. And I don't think it does appear in uh, C++, but um, I'm not too familiar with C++. But let's uh, have a look at uh, the pointers and allocatables. Um, in many cases, we can avoid pointers at all altogether uh, because allocatables um, are quite suitable and um, the compiler can uh, automatically clean them up. So if you leave the routine where you have allocated uh, some memory, 
using an allocatable variable. Um, that uh, variable will be uh, cleaned up, uh, deallocated automatically. And you don't have to worry about that, um, which is uh, um, which is something I, I quite like about it. Um, it has been around since Fortran 95, this, this feature. Um, and Fortran 95 also introduced much more, uh, much more places where you could use an allocatable. Pointers are especially uh, suitable for things like uh, a non-contiguous part of an array. I've got it in here, um, a rather, rather strange uh, 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 example, but um, you can use a pointer to um, allocate um, non-trivial slices of an array. So here we have um, the first part, um, the first index uh, from this array, uh, one, three, five, seven, nine, and this one, two, six, 10, 14, uh, etc. And this will become a two-dimensional array which only accesses these particular uh, arguments, um, elements of the array. Um, if you need to do something like that, um, and it's more common to have um, a slice um, which selects, say, the second or the third uh, dimension, then certainly use uh, a pointer, because it's not, not always easy to do that um, in another way, although you can also pass such um, uh, such array slices directly. Another place you can use them, um, and allocatables are less uh, less useful, are things like an, a linked list or a tree, um, even though you can indeed use uh, an allocatable here. I just tried it, I wasn't quite sure that uh, it could. Um, but in general, I'd say uh, allocatables are, um, are the way to go. And only if you can't do things um, that way, then pointers are, um, are the, 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 the solution. <coughs> like I said, allocatable arrays and allocatable scalars are automatically deallocated when uh, the routine uh, that contains them um, returns, contains them as a local variable. Um, you can also um, deallocate them yourself, like shown here. So you allocate work array, do some, some stuff, and you deallocate it. Well, this is um, very clear uh, also in, in terms of documentation. So it's clear that you have a, a local array here and that you don't need it anymore over here. Now you can also leave this out and that memory will still be freed uh, because of this particular um, property of allocatables. Um, that's only possible because the lifetime of such a local, uh, local variable is, is, uh, is quite well defined. And you can't be sure that that is the case with pointers. Um, pointers could uh, point to anything you, uh, um, you have in your program and the lifetime is simply um, simply not uh, easily um, easily identified. So with pointers, you have to do that uh, yourself, which is another uh, reason for um, for avoiding them, for for avoiding them if um, if you can. If you look at pointers in Fortran and you compare them with pointers in C and C++, well, pointers is actually um, a misleading name for, for this sort of things in, in Fortran. Um, pointers carry a lot of information. They carry um, the, the extent to the, of the memory. They're, um, um, they're point, pointing to, sorry, uh, they're pointing to, um, and that's certainly not the case in C. Um, in C++, as far as I understand, it's also simply the starting address. There's no extra information. Um, in Fortran, there is extra information. And that makes, even if you want to, want to or have to use pointers, um, that makes it much uh, safer to do that in Fortran than it is in, in C. 
Um, there are also a few limitations that uh, may be of importance uh, if you use them in Fortran. Um, one thing is we don't have any pointer arithmetic and um, I don't think it is it's even possible to do that because a pointer is just, not just um, the starting address but it carries um, all that extra information. Also, um, we don't have um, these, uh, these typecasts you have in C and C++. So, um, pointers um, always have this, this particular, um, particular type and you can't really um, convert them to another type. Uh, you can do that with um, polymorphic variables, um, the unlimited ones or the uh, polymorphic variables you get with classes. <coughs> um, yeah, that, that's what I would like to, to point out. Sorry, no pun intended. To point out about pointers in Fortran. Um, so my, my personal advice would be um, avoid them if you can. And otherwise, be aware that they um, they are a lot safer than they are in uh, in a language like C, and that actually um, the name is not uh, not very uh, um, not very well chosen if you uh, um, if you consider that all the extra information is available. I see a question. Um, A question about a recursive type. Um, I can actually show you uh, such a, an example of that. Um, where do I have it? Yes, I looked into this. Um, this is the one I wanted to show. No, sorry, wait, wait a minute. Um, I have to look for another. Too much going on here. No. I think I already uh, threw it out. Um, what I wanted to say is that you can use um, a recursive definition for types to get a linked list. Um, and I'll show you the one I have in the exercises right here. So um, here I use a pointer, <coughs> but actually you can use an allocator also. Um, Yeah, Norman Kirby uh, asks about um, recursion being very slow with long lists. Um, if you have a local pointer into the list, uh, you actually get a shorter list. Um, and of course, because you don't have to, uh, to recurse over uh, the whole list from the beginning to uh, the point where you want to get, um, that should be, uh, should be faster. Um, and that's a reason to, to use pointers also. But be aware that um, you then don't allocate memory. So you only have um, a pointer to, um, to memory that has already been allocated and you shouldn't free that. I personally have no, uh, never, um, never measured whether uh, such a recursion would be very slow or not. Does anyone have um, information, uh, more, more, um, more data on that, or is it just the idea that uh, things could be slow?
Well, if, if you uh, have a component that's a pointer and a derived type, the actual content in the derived type is just the dope vector for the pointer. Yes. Uh, and that's a rather, rather relatively fixed size thing. I think it's worth pointing out with pointers that uh, one of the main defects or disadvantages of them is that they can, <clears throat> they can be aliased. You can have two pointers pointing at the same target and this uh, screws up the optimizer in the compiler. <clears throat> so you, you get worse code typically if you use pointers than allocated this. Yes, and there's also the, um, the, the danger that you allocate it with one pointer and deallocate it with the other. And I don't think that's something you should do. Yeah, I, I think actually that you'll get an error for that from the compiler <clears throat> from the runtime. Okay. Um, in the past, I've seen things uh, getting really messed up, but it may be that uh, uh, compilers are much better uh, nowadays. I think I think this is still an issue because uh, currently I'm hunting a bug uh, where the point is associated, but when trying to deallocate, it cannot be uh, deallocated because the target is already deallocated. So probably uh, something is going on that it has been deallocated by another uh, point yeah. to the target. Uh, so you just get a runtime error. Right. And you could... You could get that, I guess, if you do something like this. Um, Something like this. And even worse, because if you write uh, associated P1, it will say true. Uh, but when you try to deallocate P1, yes. then uh, you have a bigger issue. Something of this kind, this kind. Yeah, indeed. But then associated, <laughs> not a new associate construct. But right. Okay. Yeah, indeed. Yes. Of course, associate is now a, a keyword also. So. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, um, um, you mentioned associate is a keyword. Uh, the previous slide you showed, you uh, do a pointer to a non-contiguous uh, part of the array. Yes. Can you use associate for that as well? Um, I think so, yes. Yeah, so then you don't need the pointer for that kind of, no. uh, of statements course. anymore. Uh, I'd rather have associate there, indeed. Yes, but the aliases you get with associate are local. You can't pass them like no, that indeed. for a subroutine. Uh, and that is uh, uh, exactly the reason why you like to have it, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we use it in, in, in code where, uh, the, um, where the data structures are quite deep. So with these uh, associate um, constructs, you can uh, get abbreviations of that, which makes uh, the code much more readable. But there are limitations, like uh, like uh, like I said. Okay. Um, well, let's have a look at the uh, exercises. Um, got it here. Um, 
a nice one might be to get a bit acquainted with these uh, unlimited polymorphic variables is exercise number four. Um, it's not very practical, uh, at least not in this, this, uh, this form, but uh, try it. Um, let's meet again in, uh, say, 15 minutes. And of course, uh, any questions, uh, just go and ask. Um, maybe as a question, I mean, this somehow shows the building blocks for uh, the visitor pattern. Have you implemented that in full at some point? Have you tried that? No, can you explain it a bit more? So the, the visitor pattern is, is a pattern whereby you provide a, a method for iterating over some collection and you pass in the the object that's going to operate on each item in the collection okay where it's polymorphic so that so that the the uh the collection doesn't need to know ahead of time the the things that are going to be operating on its elements okay i i wasn't aware of that uh, that pattern i'm saying I see on Slack uh, a number of uh, um, references to uh, online compilers.
Okay, well, uh, lots of uh, questions on the, uh, and discussions on the, on the, on the Slack. Um, you have been able to, to do, uh, um, to get something working or uh, should I still wait for a bit? Well, maybe as a feedback, I'm at, still at the first exercise, but this oh, is probably right. just me trying to get it perfectly <laughs> working. Um, but I think it makes sense to, if you if you like, to proceed. Oh well, I can I can wait uh, with this one. It's my last uh, um, it's my last bit of of, uh, of sheets. Uh, we can wait um, until after the, the, the after the break. Um, Perhaps otherwise uh, there will be uh, a lot of information and you still have to uh, um, to digest all that. Um, I hope you do get some some feeling for what go what's going on with uh, uh, these objects and uh, the classes. Um, I don't expect you to uh, to finish all the all the um, all the exercises all at once. Um, I formulated them as being, well, um, possible areas where you, uh, where you can use um, object-oriented programming. And um, of course, they are a bit uh, biased um, to things that I normally do. Um, so it certainly will not cover everything you can do with uh, object-oriented uh, um, the object oriented programming style. Um, so that's also something um, I would like to uh, 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 to talk about uh, with you guys. Um, the sort of things that you think um, you can use uh, OOP for um, or where um, the trade-off between the classical way of working and OOP um, goes in favor favor of the classical one. I can think of uh, discussions in the past I've had um, where indeed um, the advantages of OOP are, um, are not at all clear or even um, a really, um, really hindrance rather than a help in getting things done. 